That's enough. Go home, useless old man. The female boss yelled in an irritated tone. The jinko trees are the symbol of the town. The deforestation plan depends on tree assessment results, the female boss told me, a certified arborist to give a favorable assessment for her benefit. But of course, I wouldn't comply with that. Rather, I believed I must bring the truth to light and out those who think only of their gain. My name is Will. Today, I am attending a study session on park trees organized by the NPO group. As a member, I started this when I turned 50, making this my seventh year regularly. I tour old trees and involve myself in preservation and management efforts. The group's activities are purely voluntary. I earned my arborist certification two years ago and have occasionally conducted professional assessments. My main job is in landscaping, so I can't frequently act as an arborist, but I plan to retire soon and focus more on community service. That day, after the MPO study session, we were chatting at a diner and Mary mentioned something concerning a volunteer from the flower bed group saw a First Parts employee spreading something around the ginkgo trees. First Parts is a company in this town that sells auto parts and they have a stall facing the main road. Ginkgo trees are planted along this road as street trees, with flower beds also maintained. However, only the flower beds around first parts are withering. I see that might be a problem, so we decided to go check the site immediately. Sure enough, only the area in front of the store was yellowing and wilting. While observing, an employee from first parts came out and started pouring liquid from a plastic bottle. Look, that must be weed killer, but he's pouring it at the edge of the parking lot within the store's property. It's far from the flower beds. At that moment, the male employee pouring the liquid glanced our way, even though we were several meters away. He seemed to click his tongue in annoyance. Did he just click his tongue because we're here? Should we ask him about it? Will walked into the parking lot and approached the male employee. I thought it would be faster to ask him directly than to speculate from a distance. The employee readily admitted to using weed killer and said he would get his supervisor, asking us to wait. Soon a woman in a suit arrived. Oh, the flower beds, right? The woman who introduced herself as Susan Brown was the manager of First Parts. Weeds on our property are a nuisance when it gets warm. They attract bugs, which is unpleasant. Is that so? Do you also spray weed killer around the flower beds? Susan paused for a moment and looked directly at me. Excuse me, but who might you be? Are you with the city? No, I'm a local. I volunteer in tree preservation, and I noticed only that flower bed is withering. Well, can you ask the city about it? As you said, the flower beds aren't our responsibility. She dismissed us and started to walk back to the store, but I raised my voice a bit. If you spray weed killer on public flower beds without permission, that's vandalism. Susan seemed to pause for a moment, but continued walking as if she hadn't heard. After that, my friends and I went to talk to the city office. The reason that flower bed is wilting is likely because first parts sprayed weed killer. The volunteers entrusted by the city work tirelessly to maintain those flower beds, which are a symbol of our town along with the ginkgo trees. Spraying weed killer without permission is unacceptable. We were shocked when we heard from Michael, the city official, that section of the flower bed is scheduled to be removed. What? Really? Yes, we've received complaints from nearby residents about weeds and bugs, so the city plans to spray weed killer soon. I found this suspicious. All the other flower beds are well maintained with no weed or bug issues. Are these complaints from first parts by any chance? Well, I can't disclose that as it involves personal information. This seemed fishy. It felt like this official was siding with first parts. As we continued to ask questions, something even more shocking was revealed. Actually, there's a plan to widen that road, which involves removing the ginkgo trees and the flower beds. What? When was this decided? Are you cutting down all the trees? 
Yes, although it's not final yet, we're considering planting some trees elsewhere. They were planning to cut down the beloved ginkgo trees. Has this been approved by the city council? If you're planning to remove all the trees, you need to explain this to the local residents, I said. Well, we will consider holding an informational meeting. It seemed that they hadn't even informed the residents yet. This was getting more suspicious. We continued to question the official, but he dodged our inquiries and we learned nothing about the reason for or the process behind the felling plan. Later, the plan to remove the ginkgo trees and flower beds became known to the local residents and opinions were divided. Some lamented the loss of the cherished trees and flower beds, while others supported the plan, citing issues with fallen leaves clogging drains and roots causing uneven sidewalks. Indeed, maintaining both accessibility and aesthetics requires proper management. Even healthy-looking trees can have decaying causes. In light of this felling plan, it was decided to investigate potential tree hazards, and our NPO group would conduct the assessments. We don't yet know the final outcome, but whether the trees stay or go, it's important to investigate thoroughly and decide together. In this regard, First Part's attitude is far from commendable. They continue to spray weed killer on the flower beds and refuse to participate in discussions. Amidst all this, one day I received an invitation to the First Part's anniversary party. Although I run a landscaping business in the same town, I had never had any direct dealings with them. Curious, I attended the event and exchanged greetings. However, I couldn't stop thinking about the ginkgo trees and flower beds in front of the store. I left the party midway and went to check the flower beds. Upon closer inspection, it still seemed like weed killer or something similar had been used. If the city official's explanation about the road widening plan were true, it would be odd to spray only this section. The complaints supposedly came from the neighbors, which was likely first parts. It felt more like the city was covering up first parts unauthorized use of weed killer. Why was the city so protective of this one company? While pondering this, I was approached from behind. There you are. We invited you to enjoy the food, you know. It was Susan. From her tone, it seemed she was the one who invited me. I didn't realize we were neighbors. Besides landscaping, you're also a certified arborist. How impressive. I'm truly in awe, she said. I apologize for the other day. I didn't have my business cards with me when we met. Something felt off. The last time we met, she was condescending and unapproachable. Today, she seemed eager to win me over. Since we're neighbors, let's get along well from now on. I'm delighted to know someone as wonderful as you, William. We can exchange information, don't you think? Information exchange. I sensed this was leading to some negotiation. Touching the ginkgo tree in front of me, I said, yes, please. So what do you think about the plan to cut down these ginkgo trees? I didn't miss the brief smile that flickered across manager Susan's face when I mentioned the felling plan. After the ginkgo trees are cut down, they plan to plant cherry trees. The city is looking for a good landscaping contractor, and I'd love to recommend you, Will. Is that so? Replacing all the trees will be quite an expensive project. Indeed, there's talk of a non-competitive contract. If I put in a good word, it's almost guaranteed. Typically, city public works projects are determined by bidding. In other words, multiple contractors compete, and the one offering the lowest price is chosen. However, she mentioned a non-competitive contract, meaning the city would select a specific contractor without bidding. Why a non-competitive contract instead of bidding? Typically, non-competitive contracts offer specialized projects that only certain contractors can handle. Is there a specific reason for the non-competitive contract? Is it because I'm a certified arborist? Exactly, Will. You're very perceptive. There are some objections to the felling, so it's crucial to have a certified arborist's assessment to justify. I see. There aren't many landscaping contractors with an arborist certification. It makes sense. 
So if I assess that the trees need to be fed, I get the cherry tree replacement project. That's amazing, I said. Exactly. Isn't it wonderful? Susan replied with a laugh. Then I reverted to my serious tone. But based on the condition of the trees, there's no need for felling. Susan, who had been laughing loudly, suddenly stopped. How can you influence a city's non-competitive contract? And what's your connection with the city official regarding the flower beds? With a sour expression, Susan suddenly took out a cigarette and blew smoke in my face. You're impossible. Enough, get out of here, useless old man. She raised her voice. Just as I was taken aback by her sudden change, someone appeared. How dare you call them useless? It was the president of First Parts. He looked pale and seemed to be shaking with anger. What? He's just a landscaper, right? Don't you know he's a major landowner in this area and our company rents land from him? After that, I received a profuse apology from the president of First Parts. Susan disappeared and hasn't been heard from since. Of course, through my NPO group, I submitted the tree assessment stating no need for felling. From my interaction with Susan, it was clear that there was some collusion between First Parts and someone in the city. I felt a strong sense of duty. As one of the long-standing landowners, I have to protect this area. I believed I must bring the truth to light, and now those who only think of their own gain. Given the recent events, the most suspicious person on the city side is Michael, the official. Along with members of my NPO group and acquaintances from the local shopping district and chamber of commerce, I repeatedly demanded the city to clarify the fact using the Freedom of Information Act. We divided the task of reviewing public records. One day we found a definitive evidence. It was a record of a meeting between Susan from First Parts and Michael. The meeting took place the day after my first encounter with manager Susan. Moreover, the meeting's content was about operational issues and not weeds and insect complaints, as Michael had claimed. With this evidence in hand, I confronted Michael again. Michael, according to the records, you discussed operational issues with the manager of First Parts. As a result, the city decided to spray weed killer. Yes, that's correct. The operational issues were due to weeds and insects affecting the business. I then showed him the photos of the flower beds that I had prepared. A volunteer had individually recorded them. Look at the dates. The flower beds began withering before the meeting between First Parts and the city. This suggests that weed killer might have been sprayed before the city's decision. Did you confirm this? Well, we did. Michael visibly started to panic. When and how did you confirm this? On the day of the meeting, we interviewed First Parts. So you only confirmed this with the party under suspicion? Yes, that's correct. Michael looked down, admitting defeat. As I suspected from the start, the city official had been siding with First Parts all along. Here's likely what happened. On the day I first met Susan, I told her that spraying weed killer on the flower beds without permission could be considered vandalism. Fearing legal repercussions, she quickly went to the city and convinced the official. However, it's unlikely that she, a private company representative, could easily sway the city's stance. Michael holds a significant position, and it's hard to believe he simply accepted First Part's claims at face value. Additionally, Susan recently tried to entice me with the talk of cherry tree replacements. This suggests that this issue involves higher-level interests within the city. Susan's connections are not with Michael, but with someone higher up. When I shared my thoughts with the members helping with the investigation, one of them, Mary, said, Will, this is getting pretty serious. I'm starting to get scared. What if we face retaliation for challenging higher-ups? Mary, you've been watching too many TV dramas. It's the opposite. It's because people get scared that these individuals get more brazen. There's no need to tiptoe around this. I decided to speak with the city council member leading this felling plan. That person is Thomas Tim, a veteran councilman who has been re-elected for many years. Of course, he isn't someone I can easily meet with, 
but I managed to get an opportunity by framing it as a petition from local residents. Councilman Tim, whom I met in the city hall's meeting room, exuded a calm yet intimidating presence. However, when he spoke, it was friendly and approachable, making the petition discussion pleasant. But the atmosphere changed when I asked this question. Do you know Susan Brown, the manager at First Parts? Susan Brown? No, I don't know her. Is there a reason I should? His expression didn't change, but his voice seemed to tighten slightly. Recently, she told me that if I assessed that the jinko trees needed to be cut down, she would ensure I got the non-competitive contract for the cherry tree replacements. I have a recording. I placed the voice recorder on the table. The room fell silent, and I could hear the other participants gasp. That's unusual. Normally, it would be a bid process, so there's no place for special favors. Exactly. Her behavior has been suspicious. She also met with the city official, Michael, but our records show that before their meeting, Michael was summoned by a councilman. Councilman Tim's face showed a look of confusion, a first for today. And that councilman was you, Tim. Do you remember? Well, I discuss many matters with various officials in the council, so I don't quite recall. I placed a photo on the table. It showed Councilman Tim, another man, and manager Susan. This photo was taken at a party hosted by your supporters last year. The man in the middle is Brown, the chairman of your supporters group and Susan's father. Susan mentioned this on her blog, so there's no mistake. Councilman Tim took off his glasses and began to scrutinize the photo. Perhaps he was checking to see if anything else incriminating was captured. Well, do you remember anything now? I might have met them, but so what? You're here to discuss the ginkgo trees. Let's stick to the topic. Oh, it's very relevant. In fact, it's the core issue. I looked Councilman Tim straight in the eye. As someone entrusted with significant local land, I can't overlook city policies driven by vested interests. You're implying I'm involved in some sort of corruption. That's outrageous. Stop making baseless accusations. Councilman Tim slammed the table, causing everyone in the room to fall silent. But his reaction only strengthened my resolve. This is not baseless. These are serious allegations that the city council should investigate. What evidence do you have for this? And you, not even a council member, have no right to call for an investigation. This concerns how citizens' taxes are used, so it's not about having the right. But realistically, there are limits to what a private citizen can do. I see. So it needs to be proposed by a council member. What then? I'll run for city council in next month's election. In front of the stunned audience, I declared my intention. The previous mayor had to step down due to health issues, and a special election to fill the vacant mayor and city council seats was scheduled for next month. As it happens, one of the candidates for the new mayor is an old friend of mine. I had often helped with his campaign efforts before and intended to do so again. However, as I delved into the ginkgo tree issue, I felt compelled to get directly involved in city governance. My campaign would focus on the ginkgo tree's potential felling and the associated vested interests, collaborating with my friend, the mayoral candidate. I advocated for a thorough investigation of these issues throughout the campaign. The ginkgo trees and flower beds were town symbols, so many people were already concerned. When I explained that shady interests were involved, many supported the investigation. As the voice in favor of an investigation grew louder, both my friend and I were successfully elected based on these findings. I call for the resignation of Councilman Tim. I concluded my speech at the City Council. Today, we were debating a resolution recommending Tim's resignation. After the election, I worked with the new mayor to investigate the ginkgo tree deforestation issue. As a result, various corrupt practices were exposed to the public. The issue began when manager Susan from First Parts ordered her subordinates to spray weed killer on the flower beds along the city road. 
The reason, as she inadvertently admitted, was because bugs come out when it gets warm, which is unpleasant. From a common sense perspective, using weed killer on public flower beds for such a reason is unacceptable. However, when questioned by the police on suspicion of vandalism, this was her explanation. At the time of spraying, she was aware of the plan to remove the ginkgo trees and flower beds, so she might have thought they'll be gone soon anyway. And it was Councilman Tim who leaked the ginkgo deforestation plan to Murr. Although Councilman Tim is married, it was revealed by a weekly magazine that he had a personal relationship with Susan, who is also married. Fearing legal repercussions for the weed killer incident, she immediately contacted Tim, who then summoned Michael and instructed him to align the city's narrative with theirs. Additionally, to silence my investigation, Tim advised Susan to dangle the cherry tree replacement contractor's bait. Our investigation revealed that the cherry tree replacement contract was originally intended to be awarded to a company owned by relatives of the retired former mayor. Although the former mayor had already retired from politics, the investigation into the vested interests continues. In retrospect, if Susan hadn't sprayed the weed killer, these corrupt dealings might never have come to light. The resolution recommending Councilman Tim's resignation passed unanimously, and he soon resigned. Michael received a severe reprimand, but ultimately chose to resign voluntarily. Manager Susan was fired from first parts, and due to her exposed relationship with Councilman Tim, her husband has filed for divorce. This series of events was widely covered by various media outlets, making it difficult for the three of them to stay in this town. They have since relocated elsewhere. I continue to have busy days as a city councilman. It will take a lot of time to fully uncover the truth behind the vested interests, but my mission is to root out the corruption and restore a healthy city government. I plan to save my arborist certification, which I worked so hard to obtain, for enjoyment after I eventually retire from politics.